I was homeless about like up uh, two months, two and a half months. And when we say homeless, I mean I had places to go, but homeless is where where I would say inside. Okay, so when we say homeless, I mean that I had places to go, but they were all the wrong places. And so I decided to start the process, which I didn't know at the time. I was so hurt, like I really had nowhere to go because I didn't have a positive place to go, you know. So I'd rather sleep out of my, you know, my car, you know, and just be able to have somewhere where I call home where I can just start a process of training where I can make some money to be able to get me in my own place. I started doing the private training. I had a bunch of kids. So when I was standing out of my car at 6 in the morning, I can dress apart, I can look apart, but my soul was empty and it was damaged. So I get these kids from Brophy, Xavier, and all these kids come from school, after school, to this church to get guidance. And I train them, and they don't even know what I'm going through. But I'm pouring in love because kids is my thing. I love kids. And so, um, faking it. Faking it, man. I started finding change in me when I stopped faking it. It's not worth it, man. Sometimes when you go through things, you, you're in the darkest place. God want to show that it's him that bring you out. And the only way at the time, you're like, why me? But I wouldn't choose another way. I wouldn't be who I am today if I didn't go through those things. Everybody have their own story. And by me going through the things that I went through, it's got me close to God because I knew it was him. No one but God can pull you out of dark places like me. No, it's nothing but God can pull you out of when you don't know where your next situation is going to be, where your next job is going to be. And then you look, you stay here today and you look back like, did I just go through all that? So that has to be God, right? So when people say they don't believe in God, who brought you out of those tough times when you felt like you'd had no way? And, you, and, then, and then at that time, I'm like, I'm like God, please like, help me get out of this dark spot. And I'm like praying, I need you. I remember just saying that to God a lot. I need you. And I didn't really know how to pray. Then I start adding when I start reading my Bible, because I had a Bible at that time. In the name of Jesus, I need you. And so when you see, when you look back to what you came out of, I always tell people this. Why not you? God chose you to go through that. He could have chose anybody. But he chose you to go through it? Wow. Is that how real God is? When he chooses you to come through something because he knows that you have a testimony that this can change, this story right here can change one person's life and many others. So wonderful, man. So wonderful. I want to welcome you, all of our visitors. By the way, spring break, spring break is in effect. Half the church is gone. Um, but I want to welcome you if you're a visitor. Brandon, I've known him for about six years. I've been the pastor here. Uh, Brandon had a very promising basketball career in front of him. Um, he, he was roommates with Penny Hardaway, if that name rings a bell. They were going down the same track. Um, and things happened to Brandon. And um, he played semi-pro. Things didn't pan out the way he thought they would. Brandon became frustrated and angry and began to live a lifestyle that wasn't honoring to God, to be honest with you. Uh, when I met him, um, I knew he was walking through things. Um, I'm, I'm proud of him, and I'm proud to say six years later, he's a changed man. He is a changed man, and he walks with a humility and dependence on God that he didn't have before. And he is grateful. And the reason why when you meet Brandon, he has a heart of gratefulness is because he hasn't forgotten what God has brought him out of. And I've recognized that in the Christian life, if we are not careful, that we will get to the place in our lives where we lose our gratefulness and we continue to want more from God. And we continue to want more. We continue to grow frustrated. It's good to remember sometimes what God has done. Over the next seven weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to take a look at the Old Testament. The seven feasts of the Old Testament, every single feast that we'll look at is going to point to Jesus the first or second coming. You will see Jesus fulfilled in the Old Testament. And before we get in the word of God, I just want to take a moment to pray to get our hearts prepared and ready to dig into his word. Father, we thank you 
God, we know that there are things in our lives that we do not have. There are things that we want, there are things that we desire, there are times that we get frustrated, there are times that we are praying the same thing over and over and over and over and it seems like you're not listening sometimes. But Father, would you give us the heart of gratitude? Would you just give us the strength and joy and remind us where you've brought us from? Remind us what you have done for us. The fact that you have given your son to die on the cross to be the atonement of our sins is more than, than enough and it's more than we deserve. So God, help us to have that heart of gratefulness. Help us to have a heart of humility that only comes through intimacy with you. And God, we recognize sometimes that self-sufficiency can be the enemy of intimacy. So God, help us to be dependent on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm gonna read something to you that's a bit transparent but it's gonna bring home the point of today. When I was in college almost 20 years ago, I would, I would journal. I felt like my college years were almost a wilderness experience of getting to know who God was and having these unmet needs in my soul and I was wrestling through things and I pulled out a journal and this is a journal from about 20 years ago and as I'm flipping through my journal, I want to, I'm looking through here and I'm kind of embarrassed of who I was 20 years ago. Every journal entry start, starts with, God, would you please help me? And I list needs. God, where are you? God, when will you answer my prayers? Father, why have you forsaken me? Lord, help me. Lord, finally, I start one off with, Lord, thank you. But then the very next day, Lord, help me. Next day, Lord, help me. Next day, Lord, where are you? Next day, Father, I'm tired of hurting. Next day, thank you. This was just kind of my heart. I looked back and I was embarrassed, but as I read this 20 years later, I'm reminded of what I thought was a wilderness experience for me and how much he has done in my life. See, sometimes we have to pause long enough to remember what he's done to be reminded of who he is. When you pause long enough in your life and remember what he's done, it reminds you of who he is. This is exactly what we're gonna talk about today through the book of Leviticus. Now, if you read your Bible, typically you would start in Genesis and you'd be excited, then you continue reading. And then when you get to Leviticus, you probably skip over it because there's not always exciting stuff in it. But we're gonna go over the seven feasts and how it points to Jesus and, and what God instituted through Moses so that they would remember what God had done for them. We're gonna go backwards. The entire chapter of, of, of Leviticus 23 is going to talk about the seven feasts, but we're going to start with the last feast. We're going to go backwards, and we're going to do the Passover on Easter. I want you to listen to this today as, as Moses is, is instituting these feasts to remind them of the importance of remembering. The feast that we're going to look at today is the Feast of the Booths. These feasts were meant to have a time of celebration. I want you to listen to verse 39. He gives the instructions of what should take place. Verse 39 of Leviticus 23. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. So what's going on during this point is they would bring in all the crops. They would bring in everything that, that has been produced and they would celebrate by thanking God for the crops. Agriculture was obviously huge in this context. So they would take a moment, some would call this the feast of the end gathering. They would bring in all of the harvest and they would celebrate, God, look at how you provide. God, you are awesome. God, you are amazing. It's like this, every once in a while, um, I will bring my kids randomly into the circle of my living room. Um, I grew up in a two bedroom trailer in the backyard of my house with no AC and no heater. So I'm very grateful for the home that I have today. 
So I bring my kids in and I say, hey, we're going to take a moment and just thank God. Well, why? It's not Thanksgiving. It's not Christmas. I get it. But kids, God has given us so much. And if it wasn't for God, daddy wouldn't be a pastor. And if it wasn't for God, mommy wouldn't have married daddy. And if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't be raising you up in the ways of the Lord. So I'm trying to help my kids to understand we're going to put God first in everything. So let's pause and thank God. And we do this. And so we th- the last thing we did is several weeks ago, we thanked God for our car. And so recently, uh, it's backfired on us. We told the kids, this is God's car. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have this car. He provided. So the kids get in the car recently, about two days after, and they want to bring in um, popsicles. My wife said, hey, don't bring popsicles into my car. And my eight-year-old said, this is not your car, it's God's car. <laughs> We've got to figure this one out. Well, God doesn't like popsicles either. And, but we just remember. So this was a time for the Israelites to bring all the blessings and the crops to say, man, God is so good. God provides. He is so good. So in verse 39, he is telling them, bring everything. And I want you to celebrate on the first day shall be a solemn rest and more of a, a Sabbath just to pause. And on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. So it starts with the Sabbath and ends with the Sabbath. Then it says this, and you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid trees. This is a lot of information, but I'm going to break it down for you. It can get really confusing. By the way, it took me 40 hours to study this feast, which it does typically every sermon. There's so much information in here that I'm going to encourage you to go study it on your own. I have picked out what I feel like would be important for us as a church. Every single thing I'm going to read to you has a strong symbolism and and prophetic word pointing to Jesus. All these feasts are going to point to Jesus. All of them will. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Days Rejoice for seven days. People would come from everywhere during this time. All the nations would come. They would come together and they would, for seven days, they would take vacation time and for seven days just say, I'm just going to thank God. For seven days. This blows my mind because I have extreme ADD and it's hard for me to sit down for 30 minutes and be quiet. They did it for seven days. We, we are afraid of silence and solitude because it's awkward. Like, watch this. You weren't supposed to do that. (laughs) But it's awkward. And it's hard just to sit and get rid of all of the distractions in life to close the laptop, to turn off social media, and to sit before the creator and hear his heart for you. I mean, we have an invitation by the creator And we don't take it often, do we? And if we take it, we take a fast food option for him. Speak to me quick. Because I don't want to sit too long in silence, God. Here he's telling them seven days. Seven days. I want you just to sit and celebrate what I have done for seven days. Verse 41 says, you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. So keep doing this so nobody forgets what I've done for you. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. When they celebrated this, this is really important if you're taking notes. They celebrated this during their September, October. This was the last feast, September, October. Don't forget that date. They celebrated in the seventh month. You shall dwell in the booth for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. If you've never read the Bible, here's what he's saying. God wanted the people of Israel to remember that it was God that brought them out of the wilderness, that they had tough times, they, had, they went without provision and it was God that provided for them. It was God that dropped manna out of the sky and fed them when they were hungry. It was God who parts the Red Sea. It was God who did these things. So God is saying, I don't ever want you to forget what I've done for you. I don't ever, have you ever met someone and you just like, man, they ooze Jesus because they have not forgotten who they were? And who they are now because of Jesus. 
This was the thing. He's like, don't forget. And the way I don't want you to forget is this. Every year for seven days, I want you to build this homemade tabernacle, this homemade booth. In the Hebrew, this is called a sukkot. A sukkot means a dwelling place. It means a little a booth or a tabernacle. This is a sukkot. Today, Jews still do it. Jews do it in our community here in Phoenix. If you've ever seen this, you would see people do a homemade uh, kind of a tent. Some have tents. They look all kinds of different ways. But here's the idea behind it. You're supposed to build this. And for seven days, you don't take your Nintendo Switch. You don't take your iPhone. You don't take any of that. For seven days, you celebrate. What do you celebrate? Well, there are three things they typically remembered. They come in here outside their homes. This still happens today. It still happens today. They come in here for seven days and they celebrate and they offer sacrifices to God, fruit offerings, vegetable offerings, and there's a burning fire there. And for seven days, they're just reading scripture and they're, they're, they're singing psalms and they're just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. What are they doing for seven days in the tent? What are they doing? You know, there's something about, if you've ever gone camping, there's something about leaving the distractions of life and looking at God's creation and the mountains and the moon and the stars. And it just changes your perspective, doesn't it? It just reminds you like, you are so big, God. Why am I so worried? You hung this stuff. You are huge. This is what this was supposed to do. It did three things for these people during the time, and people still do it today. Typically, there's um, an open sky. You can see through this here, but here's what you were supposed to do. Number one, you were supposed to remember that God has forgiven you of your sins. This feast of the booth came five days after the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. After five days after they had the Days of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, and their sins were forgiven, they would come in here and they would look up into the sky and they would celebrate, thank you, thank you, thank you for forgiving my sin. Think about the worst thing you have ever done in this room today. The worst thing you have ever thought. And to be reminded and to know that your sin under the blood of Jesus cannot overpower what he's done on the cross. No matter how bad you are today, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, because of what he has done, he has covered your yesterday, today, and tomorrow. These people knew that their sins were forgiven. They didn't take that lightly. Sometimes we're too flippant and we lose our gratitude towards God as if we deserve to be forgiven. But when you bring your sin before a holy God and you look at him and you look at you, you can't help but to say, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done in my life. The believer should never forget what Christ has done for you. We should never forget what he has done for you. So God forced them to do this so they would not forget. So they would come in here and they would sing and they would celebrate and they would just sing praises and psalms. And the first thing they did was, thank you, thank you, you are amazing. It was nothing that I had to offer you. It is you and the sacrifice, it was you. Praise God, hallelujah, God, thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. So they're rejoicing at this point. I mean, they're dancing, they're doing the gritty, they're doing everything because they're excited. You don't know what their gritty is? Don't worry about it. It's a new age dance. They're just really excited about this. Just like, praise God, what he's done, what he's done. The second thing they do, they take their eyes off what they don't have. They take their eyes off what they don't have. You know the difference in my journal between um, the days that I was saying, God, please, God, where are you? This was during my singleness. You know what this is filled with? God, where is my wife? God, when is she coming? God, I'm really lonely. God, where are you? God, do not hear me. God, my friend who is not good looking just got married. Why am I still single? Like it's filled with this kind of stuff. And then finally, Lord, I thank you and I praise you because of who you are and who you're making me to be. Finally, I took my eyes off myself and what I didn't have and I put my eyes on him and who he is. This was intended for the people of Israel because they were complainers. If you read the Old Testament, they complained about everything. 
God would do something miraculous in their life. And then life will get hard and they'll be like, where are you? Do you not love me? And God's like, look, I just dropped manna out of the sky and fed you. What else do you want? It'd be equivalent to us, like Chick-fil-A just falling out. Like, whoa, this is amazing. The little chicken biscuits. And he did that for them. And they'd go through a hard patch of life. I'm like, where are you? Have you left us? He's like, oh, have you not remembered what I've done for you? Fine, let me part the sea again. And he'd do these things and the people's heart would go back. Let me just tell you, there's a piece of Israelite in all of our hearts. Because we are tempted to question after he does something miraculous, where are you? How much, like how many miraculous things has God done in our lives? Yet when we hit a little bitty hard patch, we're like, where are you now? And we're, we don't pause long enough to read the journal of our life and to be reminded of what he's done. And when you're reminded of what he's done, you're reminded of who he is. So they, they were sitting here and they were celebrating, man, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. The second thing they did was this. They're like, you delivered us out of Egypt. You brought us, bought us out of bondage of slavery. You're amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the third thing was this. Then they would switch their attention for this. And you're going to provide. You are going to provide for us. You're going to keep providing the way you provide because you're an awesome God and we're your children. You're going to provide the Messiah. At this point, the Messiah wasn't here. And they're saying, you're going to provide the Messiah. You're going to be a redemptive God. You're going to be a rescuer. He is coming. We love you. And what they would do is they would sing hymns out of the Psalms. And they would sing hymns like this. They would just, they would sing this way. And they would sing this way. They would shake it up and down. They would turn it all around. That's what it's all about. That's really what they did. That's what they did. And they were just praising. It still happens today, by the way. Then what would happen, it happened every single day. Everything was uber symbolic from the branches and the fruit. Everything represented something. They would bring out this citrus fruit. It looks like a lemon. The fruit represented the heart of humanity. It represented repentance. Everything meant something. And then here's what would take place as a way to really honor God, as a way to have this sacrificial system. Everything was very intentional. What took place next was pretty incredible. And you're going to see some pictures of a modern time ceremony. There are two ceremonies that you won't see in scripture, but that are in the Old Testament. They were instituted by man. They were instituted as human tradition. Usually I would not preach on anything like this, but it's in the Talmud. Uh, uh, if you read the rabbinic literature, it's still present today. They still practice this today. I would never mention it because it's man's tradition and it's not in scripture. However, it's not in the Old Testament. It is in the New Testament. And Jesus used man tradition to point to himself. Here's what they instituted as part of this ceremony. Two ceremonies is what they instituted. A water ceremony and a light ceremony. So I want you to see this picture, and I'm going to explain it as it goes through. This is kind of just a makeshift picture to give you an idea. They would come into the temple court. They had to be separated from male and female. The female would be at the top. The male would be at the bottom. You can see what are the men doing. They're doing the gritty. They're dancing. They were celebrating. They would celebrate. They would dance. They weren't Baptist. They would celebrate. They would dance. They would say, you are good, God, and they would sing, and it was like a huge party. As they prep for this, if you've ever been to a farmer's market, it looked like a farmer's market. There, I'm serious. There was music. There was food, fruit, vegetable. People were everywhere. And then I want you to take a look at this next picture. Um, this is more of a real life, not my bald head, the picture. Thank you. Here's what they would do. As part of the ceremony, there is a water ceremony. They would go to the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam is where Jesus healed the blind man. They would go to the pool of Siloam and they would bring water out. And there was this huge ceremony of the pouring of the water. And here's what would take place. Go to the next picture. Um, the priest would come into the courtyard. There are trumpets. As soon as he hit the courtyard gates, the trumpets would go off like it is here. Here it is. Here is the priest. The Leviticus priests were there. Leviticus priests, the Levites were kind of like their worship pastors. 
They were there leading this processional. They would come in. This is a modern day picture, by the way. Um, this is still what happens. They're, they would come in and they would celebrate hundreds and thousands of people. Go to the next picture. And just to give you an idea, they would bring it to this altar. The reason why you see the ramp on the altar, watch this, God is incredible. Um, in this culture, it's not good to show skin. It's not good to show nakedness. Nakedness is a reminder of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. They were naked and afraid. Nakedness is a reminder of sin. This is why in the prodigal son, when the father ran and pulled his robe up, he showed his skin, his nakedness, to cover his son's shame. When Jesus died on the cross, he showed his humanity, but didn't, still had his divinity. So in here, there's this ramp. The ramp, uh, typically there can be bigger altars. This was an altar for them. Uh, typically it could be bigger, but when the priest would walk upon there with his robe, uh, it wouldn't show his legs is the idea. It wouldn't show his skin, his humanity. Go to the next picture. What they would do is bring this water and they would pour the water as a way to, for kind of two symbols here. God, will you pour out rain for the next crops, the next season? Remember, during this time, there were false gods. There was, there was Baal, the god of creation, who they worship for rain, for the agriculture. So here's what they're doing. They're saying, no, God, you are the god of rain. You are the god of agriculture. So they're pouring out this, saying, God, would you please bring the rain? The one on the left side, which you would see, is that is wine. Um, some in the Old Testament would use blood as a picture of the sacrifice. While this was happening, there was another person who was walking with them, and they would walk and they would do this with the palm branches or whatever they, the willow book branch. This was a picture that it was bringing wind with these two guys who were bringing the wine, blood, or water. Wind during this time represented ruach or pneuma. Ruach in the Old Testament is breath. It represents the spirit of God. So what they did was they had three things going on. The wind, the spirit of God, the water, and the blood. During this time, now watch this. This is what's going to blow your mind. They're sitting here and they're celebrating. Then they would read scripture. During this time, I just want you, I know this is a lot of information, but I want you to stay with me. Just for a minute, here's what happened during the water ceremony. Jesus was part of this ceremony. He was present when this ceremony was happened. So if you picture the courtyard, we have a picture of a courtyard that's packed out here. If you picture the courtyard, if you picture the courtyard, hey, that's good. So if you picture the courtyard, they're doing these ceremonies. And so I want you to think about this, the the. The priests would come in and um, the people had these and, and they would come out and everyone's celebrating and here's what would go on. The priests and would come out, the high priest would, everybody, there's the wind, there's the wind blowing with the branch. He would come out and they would cheer and he'd pour the water out saying, God, pour your blessing and pour your spirit out on us. Then they would have the blood or their wine representing sacrifice. God, pour this out. This is the sacrifice. Yes, yeah, celebrate. Woo, God is good and they would celebrate while they are doing this this is crazy Jesus stands up in the middle of this everybody is celebrating the courtyards are packed out you turn to John chapter 7 and listen to this text listen to what the text said on the last day of the feast the great day which feast is that it's this feast so Jesus stands up in the middle of this feast, when everyone is saying, God, pour out your spirit, pour out your blessing, and they're saying, God, pour out your, your breath, give us life, and they're doing all of this ceremonial stuff, the boldness of Jesus stands up on the last day of the feast, the feast of the booth, the great day. Jesus, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. They are pouring this out, and he is saying, if, if you want to really be fulfilled, I am the picture. I am the fulfillment of what's being poured out. He says, if anyone thirst, come after me. And then he says this, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, 
out of his heart will flow the rivers of living water. Why does Jesus say as scripture has said? So during this time, as they're pouring out water and pouring out wine, scripture is being read. What scripture is being read? This is the scripture that Jesus is referring to. Isaiah chapter 12, you will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. This word salvation in verse three in the Hebrew is Yeshua. So watch this in verse three, I'm gonna read it again. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of Yeshua. Who was Yeshua? God in flesh, Jesus. In this moment, as they're singing this song, as the water is being poured, saying, with joy, with, we'll draw water from the wells of Yeshua. You will draw water from the wells of Yeshua and he will give you life. And they're celebrating. And Yeshua, God in the flesh, stands up, says, I am that well you are singing about. That is me. I am the well. I am salvation. And they missed it. And they missed it. They missed God in the flesh. God dwelling with man. A human tabernacle, a human Sukkot is what Jesus became. They missed it. After they did this ceremony, if you can imagine, Jesus stood up and everyone's looking at him like, you you tripping. Security, come get this guy. He just claimed to be God in the flesh. Why was he crucified? For blasphemy. Look what happens next. After this, celebration went crazy. They would light up these candles that rabbis say, rabbinic literature, rabbinic literature says that, says that this was so bright, it lit up the entire city of Jerusalem. And they would celebrate and you would have dancers. Dancers who would have torches, who would throw it up and dance and everyone's celebrating. Like, yeah, we, we poured out the water and the sacrifice, he is good and they're celebrating. During this time when these lights were so bright that lit up everything, guess what Jesus said? John chapter eight, in the middle of the celebration, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. They're celebrating, pointing to the Messiah and he's saying, I am the thing you're celebrating. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. And then all of a sudden the Pharisees saying, are you kidding me? Are you bearing witness on yourself? And they begin to attack Jesus. And there's this huge celebration. And Jesus is saying, look, I am this. I am what you're celebrating. You know what's amazing? In this moment, while they have this human celebration, you see the water, you see the wind, you see the blood. You see the wind, the spirit of God. You see the water, represents the life of God. You see the blood represents the son of God. I'll prove it to you. John chapter 19. I don't think you believe me, so I'm gonna prove it. John chapter 19. You see these three things taking place. Now listen to this in John chapter 19. As they went out and crucified Jesus, bearing his own cross to the place that called the place of skull. When, 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 skull, when Jesus was crucified, we know exactly what took place in verse 34. Now, here he is. They took him out to the place. They crucified him. And watch this, verse 34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once, there came out blood and water when they pierced our Savior to represent the spirit, the blood, the water, this was the Messiah. You know what's even crazier? My wife said, don't tell you this because it might confuse you. How intentional our God is. You know when Jesus was born? When you trace it back, 
and you do the homework, he was born September, October. So watch this. This is going to mess up your Christmas, isn't it? But watch this. He was born in a manger. Rabbinic scholars would say he was born during the Feast of Tabernacle in a Sukkot. Sukkots in Genesis were also meant to hold animals. So scholars would say, they would argue to say this, when Jesus was born, there was no place for him at the end because this great festival was going on and everything was packed out. And these people made these homemade tents. So when Jesus was born, there was no place for him. And so it just so happened that they found maybe a Sukkot, something like this, that was homemade, that the Savior was dwelling in, was was birthed in. Here he is, Jesus in a Sukkot. What did the Sukkot represent? The forgiveness of sins God has provided and God will provide. While they're out here singing about the future Messiah, he is saying, I am here, I will forgive, I will provide, I am am your savior and deliverer. I get excited. You don't have to get excited. That is crazy. So, so while they're celebrating God's provision, they're literally celebrating God's provision. And while they're celebrating God's provision, God provided. While they're celebrating God's provision, God provided. My challenge for you today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the band comes up, we're gonna sing one last song, we're gonna celebrate. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, here's my challenge for you. I'm sure there's a lot on your plate that you don't have. There's a lot of hurts, there's a lot of challenges, and I don't dispute that. I have those too, by the way. I'm sure you probably have a journal that matches mine. And you're saying, man, I've been through so much, Pastor. And I get it. My challenge to you if you're a Christian in this room today, will you pause long enough to remember? I know their challenges, church. Man, I know life is hard. I know. But when you only look at the struggles, you forget to take comfort in the Savior. When you only stare at your struggles, It's amazing to me. When I stare at my struggles, they are just mountaintops. It's like I can't move this. But when I stare at my Savior, they just seem like pebbles to him. Will you pause long enough to remember? One of the things I love doing is I like to go walk up mountains by myself. When I am stressed like you get stressed, when I'm frustrated like you get frustrated, When I'm angry, in case you didn't know, your pastor gets angry. When I get angry, when I've been hurt and betrayed, when I'm tired and I don't feel like going anymore, that happens to me too, by the way. You just get so tired and exhausted. You know what I do? I go buy a shirt from Lululemon because it makes me feel better. (laughs) Then, I'm joking. But if we are not careful, you can, you can be exhausted, tired, and angry. And then you depend on fleshly things to fix a spiritual issue. I've done it. That you think a fleshly answer will fix a spiritual problem. And I go out to the mountain. And here's what I do, man. exactly what I do I'm just quiet I'm just trying to listen I'm trying to fix my eyes and heart on him and no matter how angry I am you know what I do next I sing one of my favorite songs to him I know it's cheesy but what I do next I just want to remember that my flesh is telling me that you have left me but that's not true because my Bible says that you would never forsake me. So I sit there and I just to myself, what he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. And 
my heart just starts changing. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. And I'm just, it's not good, by the way. This thing is not good. But my heart gets better. And you know what's crazy? I just thank him. I just thank him and I remember who I used to be. I'm so grateful. So grateful that when I was broken and a punk inner city Houston kid, that he reached my heart on a basketball court and brought me out of my sorrow. What he's done. What he's done. I'm so grateful that in my brokenness he reached out and he called my name. so grateful that when I didn't even know North Phoenix Baptist Church existed that God found me in Arkansas and he called my name and my heart changes from what I don't have to what he's done and when I come down from the mountaintop experience my circumstances are still there because of who he is and what he's done. My encouragement to you today, if you're a Christian in the room, we can learn something from this. To find your own Sukkot and to find a place where you get away with God and you force it in a habitual routine in your life, daily, weekly, and you keep the heart of gratitude for what he's done Father, we love you. We praise your name for what you've done. We praise your name for who you are. We don't have all the answers. We don't have everything we want. But when we are angry, when we are tired, when we are weary, we can pause long enough. the great I am that you are the fulfillment of all scripture that you are the rescuer the redeemer the savior you are Yeshua you are salvation and if that is all you did for us that is enough we will praise you if forgiveness is all we had then forgiveness is all we need you are Yeshua it's in Jesus name we pray amen